Hey, man, what's up? Have I... Have I heard about... Oh, yeah, no. Dude, that is not a big deal. We have an open relationship. It's very advanced. Nothing to work. No. no, 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 I know, I know. She's been messing around with PC for years. It really, dude, it is not a big deal. Uh, Switch, well... No, no, we, we talked about Switch. That was just like a temporary thing. One or two times on Switch, no big deal. She... Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that she's telling people we're not exclusive at all anymore? Are you f PlayStation? Hey everybody, this is Catch My Drift and I am Jake Steinberg and last week Sega revealed Sonic X Shadow Generations in a PlayStation State of Play. So this is a remaster of Sonic Generations with more content including a new campaign featuring Shadow the Hedgehog. Now, I think a lot of people don't understand why this is a big deal. I think a lot of people said, oh, okay, a remaster of an old Sonic game, whatever, and they moved on. And I think that these people don't respect Shadow the Hedgehog, who, as you can tell from the title of this video, I think is a perfect character. Okay, so let's set this up. Let's talk about why. To Sonic fans, I think Shadow, to Sonic fans, I think that Shadow is more iconic of a character than Sonic the Hedgehog himself. And I know what you're thinking. I know how crazy this sounds. I know that Sonic is objectively like a bigger deal. Sonic is more famous than Shadow, but let me explain. I think that Sonic is powerful because he has managed to be iconic in a way where you ignore everything that's weird about him. He has reached that level of icon. You don't need, it doesn't even phase you all of these weird elements about Sonic. And that is true icon status. You don't think about everything that's weird about this guy. And he is a major weirdo. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. For real now, I think this is important. So let's take a look at Sonic. Okay, here we go. When you look at Sonic, I think you go, oh yeah, that's Sonic. And you don't even think about elements of his design that are extremely weird. You don't think about how he has one giant, you know, cranial housing unit for his single eyeball that has two independently moving pupils inside of it. You don't think about how he's got these, these ears. Yeah, normal ears, right? But they've got no sockets. They've got no canals. They've got no holes. Okay? And his mouth hole moves unilaterally across his mouthpiece area. How, how does that work? How does his mouth move across his mouthpiece? He's got weird ooze on his shoe. And the nose. Look at that nose. What the f*** is this? But we just don't think about any of this stuff when we look at Sonic. He's made it all so normal. Now, think about this. If somebody asks you, what is iconic about Sonic the Hedgehog, you will probably answer, oh, he's, you know, a blue hedgehog and he runs fast. And that's kind of it. Like, what really else is there? So now, in this, in this question of what makes an icon, let's turn it over to Shadow the Hedgehog. So the beauty of Shadow, I think, is that he takes everything Sonic establishes, everything Sonic has, but he remixes what you have come to understand and expect into something more interesting, something more memorable. Somebody like Knuckles is like the beta version of what's going on here. You know, Sonic's red rival. He's got big hands. That's kind of it. That's kind of all Knuckles has going for him. But Shadow is more than just a different color. Like really, just by looking at him here, you can see that he's got those cuffs on his ankles and his wrists, right? And they look like the franchise's golden rings, something that Sonic established. But Shadow, like he does with Sonic's basic design, he takes something we recognize, but then takes advantage of it in a unique way. Way. Rings, they may be power and life for Sonic, but Shadow wears them like jewelry. And I really think that you can kind of see this whole idea across Shadow's entire character. Like, for example, every character in the Sonic universe runs fast. We all talk about Sonic running fast, but in all the games, all the characters can run fast. But Shadow skates with these, like, weird air shoes, right? We all know what I'm talking about, and it's memorable, even if it does look a little silly. 
We've had Chaos Emeralds in this entire franchise, but the way that Shadow uses them is, again, memorable and iconic, and it's something that you imagine hearing, like, kids shout out on the playground. Chaos Control! I really see that for Shadow. I really do. I really see like a kid yelling out like chaos control. Like it's silly and fun, but memorable and iconic. And I don't really see anybody like what are the, if you're if you're being Sonic in this scenario, you're the kid playing Sonic. What are you yelling out? What? How do you identify yourself as Sonic? What? But now, okay, we've set everything up. Now we get to throw this puppy wide open, okay? Because I think Shadow occupies like this narrative position, the same narrative position as characters like Riku from Kingdom Hearts or Vegeta from Dragon Ball Z or even like Wario in the Super Mario Brothers, right? Because there's like this darker rival and in each instance here, there's like that base character that establishes the norm of the franchise and now we we have the sexy alternative that you find yourself rooting for. And I think characters in this position get more freedom. They get to be more interesting. I think especially with something like somebody like Vegeta, you see like, oh, Shadow's got those funny air shoes and the stuff that he uses. And Vegeta, he shows up like with his little scouter, right? It's this, it's this remix on what we already get from the main character. They're using new things, using them in different ways, and it leads to iconic, memorable moments. It's over 9,000! 9,000?! And I do think, for the record, I do think that this is more than being a foil. I think characters like Shadow are the dark, brooding, self-serious ones that get to employ a strategy I call the laugh-at-me-but-don't-you-dare-laugh-at-me strategy. Shadow uses guns. His theme music is intense and brooding. Shadow has life or death stakes. He has a relationship with a dying human girl that legitimately traumatizes him. All of this stuff, it shouldn't work. It should be embarrassing. But if you are a Sonic fan, this lets you do two things. One, you get to kind of ironically enjoy Shadow, enjoy that he's like this campy, edgy character. You know, you're laughing at him, not with him. But alternatively, Maybe secretly, maybe, you also enjoy that there is a character here with just way more going on than Sonic. What? I want you to listen to Shadow's last words here in Sonic Adventure 2. Maria, this is what you wanted, right? This is my promise I made to you. What? What is this man about? He is just compelling in a way that Sonic can't be. You know, I think Sonic shattered the glass ceiling of what a video game hedgehog could be, but Shadow controls all of the weirdness. He controls the chaos. Chaos control! and synthesizes it into meaning. Like Sonic established a franchise, but Shadow has a more individual purpose. He gets more freedom. And it's no surprise that his main dramatic question deals with trying to figure out exactly who he is. Um, I love Shadow. I cannot wait for Sonic X Shadow uh, Generations. And I hope you'll be back next week to catch my drift. Thank you. Um, so I talked about this in like the opening bit a little bit, you know, I, I nodded to it, but I want to talk about it a little bit more. I don't think my audience is like super into the Xbox ecosystem or what's going on there. But if you are, please let me know in the comments below. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more. But uh, the big story that's kind of been dominating the video game headlines for the past week-ish is this idea that um, Xbox exclusive games, pretty much all of them, will be making their way over to competing platforms. That like Microsoft has a different business strategy for the Xbox platform. And people are starting to panic about this. I think that the the story 
that the Xbox, you know, changing their business strategy, I think that that's one part of the story. I think the bigger part of the story actually is how this has caused people in the Xbox video game space, kind of like a lot of the, the influencers, media people, to completely freak out. And I want to point to, there's like this great uh, VGC article all about this. I'll link to it in the description below about like all the different statements these Xbox heads are making because these video games are going to go into other platforms, you know, people literally losing their minds, like talking about it in the same way that they would talk about like somebody dying. It's really, the VGC article is a great read. You should definitely click it, scroll through, read the whole thing. Um, but this is wild to me for so many reasons. First off, I think it, it pretty much goes without saying that if you paid $60, or you probably didn't, you just paid for Game Pass, whatever it is you paid to uh, play these games on Xbox over how many years, you know, you have already gotten your value from paying that money. You got the value of playing Starfield in 2023. You paid for that. You got it. You got something that these people that only own a PlayStation don't have. So there is no like, there is no like great loss unto you. And I understand that people are kind of like, pivoting now and doing this whole thing where it's like well it's actually it's actually about the digital library and it's actually about this but I think it's a whole lot of fronting and it's just people that are so attached to the Xbox brand they've invested so many of their own identity points into a brand and product that they consume under under capitalism which is always a, a mistake because stuff like this will happen but um and now they're kind of freaking out because it's like oh my god a part of my identity is eroding something that i identify with so strongly this brand is starting to disappear what's going to happen to me i think that's like the identity crisis a lot of people are happening uh, are having here and the one thing i want to say about this and i know normally I'm like, I'm like the goof, I'm the goof, you know what I mean? I think people come to me because they want like a funny take on things. I just kind of want to make this, make this point. I think like if you're online and you are holding a funeral service for exclusive games, not coming to the video game system that you play on, if this is registering to you as like a big, bad, horrible, terrible thing that's happening to you and all of these other, you know, the oppressed class of gamers, uh, I think you need to look inward. I think that there is a legitimate problem with looking out at the world and saying the the bad thing happening that I need to give my attention to right now is the loss of exclusive video games. I I like not to make too bold of a statement, but there might be something wrong with you, you know? And I think I've already accepted that Gamers are always going to care more about the video games that they play, the product they consume, than the people that make them. So, I, again, I've accepted this, so I'm not going to be one of those people that's out here being like, you know, care about the developers, all of this, the the layoffs and stuff, and nobody cares, you know, because cause I, I kind of feel like I'm, I would just be yelling into the void, yelling at nobody. I don't think I'm going to convince you. But um, there's so, you know... We are in such a privileged position to care about video games and think about them as much as we care and think about these things. That is so, that is such an amazing place to be. Even when, like, if, if the worst thing going on in your life right now is that Xbox is losing exclusive games, take a minute to look inward. R remind yourself how amazing that is. That that's what's so awful that's going on in your life. And ultimately... Uh, get a grip, man. Get a grip. So that's it. That's that's the end of the episode. Um, just for anybody that's tuned in, that's that's waited this long, that's gotten through all the way to the end here. I do want to say I'm I'm looking into doing things like uh, streams and other forms of content. So if you have an idea for something else that you would like to see me do, leave a comment below. Go to my Patreon, Patreon.com/slash Jake Steinberg. Uh, let me know what you think, what you would like to see, and maybe you'll see it in the future. Thanks again. Bye.